in the chat. The colleagues will let me and Tina, who are moderating the session, um, know, and we will give the translator enough time to switch channels um, to then um, moderate for the English speakers. Uh, next slide, please. So the session is basically divided in two major parts. Um, we will be um, uh, receiving a presentation from Kidami, uh, Kidani Mariam from, from GWP in Southern Africa. Please keep your microphone um, who is going to set the tone by presenting us the um, institutionalization strategy in the Southern African region um, by mainly focusing on SADEC's Nexus governance framework. This will be followed by a Q&A. And then the second part will be a structured interview session with um, our guest speakers, Deepak Yavali and Seppo Rikolainen, um, who come from very different perspectives. Uh, we have Deepak from Nepal and Seppo from um, Finland, who will be sharing their experiences um, with regards to WebNexus and specifically institutionalization with us um, through the interview round. Um, Tina and I will be moderating the interview round. We have some questions prepared, but we um, encourage all participants to come in at any point through the raising their hand function and to yeah, carry the interview with us together. And finally, Mariana will um, close the session with some sure, wise closing words. Um, and with this, I pass on to Sophie for some welcoming words. Sophie from the EU, the floor is yours. Hello, yeah, thank you. Um, good morning or whatever to everyone here. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sophie breul busson and I'm working in the European Commission uh, in the Directorate General for International Partnerships. And I'm more particularly working on uh, water issues in a thematic unit called Environment and Sustainable Natural Resources. So in this, uh, in this unit, I am following the uh, Nexus Regional Dialogue Program uh, Phase 2. Uh, as you know, Nexus approach, it's about uh, no longer silo, but holistic and integrated approach as uh, energy, water and food are just part of the same process, which is not far from just life. And um, last week, you may remember there was some disclosure of the next uh, in the media of the next um, uh, IPCC report. And I was struck by the headlines of, of a French newspaper just pointing to malnutrition and droughts. And I thought, I thought, uh, that's it. I mean, water, food, energy, this is the nexus. This is where we are. And the nexus approach, with the nexus approach, I think we just are in. We are really in it. It's really challenging but it's part of the necessary shift if we wanna uh, win this battle so i think it's really important and i really wish you today and and for for the rest of the program of course and but later on as well uh, very fruitful discussions uh, knowledge experience practices sharing uh, towards the nexus institutionalization in your various uh, regions, but as well thinking as well on the implementation of it, because it's really tremendously important. We are just in, we do our part of it, but let's do it well and with the whole hurt we can put in it. So I thank you very much for your work and your involvement. Um, and uh, well, let's say I'm opening or I have the honor to open this uh, this series of webinars with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so far, FC, for these very motivating words. Then with, since we are very, um, and, and like Sophie said in the beginning, it's a bit of a challenge to know at the, the different time zones we're all in. Um, and it's, we actually have a challenge in this time of the year 
to find an appropriate time uh, time span. And it's very short, it's only one hour. So we will continue straight ahead with the next slide. Um, instead of doing a classic uh, introduction round where we pass the spotlight and the floor to each and every one of you, we've decided to cut that short. Um, and um, I will quickly give you an idea of the different participants. And I hope that we hear from each and one of you during the Q&A and the interview rounds anyway. Um, so from the Niger Basin Authority, we have Didier Zinzu, who's the director of the Niger Basin Observatory, and, the, um, and Mamane Abdou, who's the expert, a monitoring and evaluation expert. Um, follow, staying in the same region, um, we have the GIZ NRD team uh, made up of Robert, Kranefeld, Dr. Musa Ibrahim, and Thomas. Uh, Thomas. Um, then moving on to the MENA region, um, we have Dr. Hamu Lamrani, who's representing the League of Arab States. Hello, Hamu. Um, and I'm not sure they're actually part of the call yet, but had, they had accepted the invitation. We have Hanin Sadeh and Raya Al Masri. Um, Hanin is working for the GIZ, Raya is an independent uh, consultant advising um, a Nexus Water Energy um, Working Group at, uh, in Jordan. Um, then uh, the GIZ NRD team uh, made up of Jahida Bukhalfa, who's starting today. Welcome, Jahida. I'm not sure she's in the call. I haven't seen her, uh, but she might be there. And myself, um, moving on to the next region, we have... We're in Southern Africa now, um, where we welcome our colleagues Shamiso and Kidane from the Global Water Partnerships. Then we move on to, I think, let, no, to Central Asia, sorry. And here we have um, our colleagues, I think I saw Rustam earlier, from Karek, um, who are representing the National Regional Dialogues for Central Asia. Then we move on to um, Latin America, um, represented today by Antonio um, from the GIZ, who's the regional coordinator for the regional dialogue in Latin America. And then finally, we move on to the Germany team, the Nexus Secretariat with Mariana as a head, um, Tina, Stephanie, Eva, and myself in the Secretariat team. And without further ado, I pass the floor on to Kidane for his presentation. Kidane, the floor is yours. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Irene. I think I will switch off the video to just say hello to colleagues. Um, please confirm if you can hear with me. If you yes. can hear me properly. Yes, we hear you okay. very well. Thank you very much. So um, I'll be I'll be trying to share uh, with you our experience in the SADC region. So, uh, Kidane again working for GWP South Africa. I hope also my colleague Shami, so um, she will also be part of uh, this. So next uh, slide, please. Zahari. So that's basically the um, experience I'll I'll try to share with you. So I'll not give you a lot of background, but try to share with you what was the process in the SADC region as we uh, develop the regional framework for wave nexus in SADC region. Next slide, please. So the first thing we did in, in the SADC region is actually to um, establish a common understanding um, what is nexus, wave nexus approach, and what does it do for the SADC region. I think that is very important experience, actually, because the first challenge we faced was SADC was saying, why should you embrace the wave nexus approach in the first place? Can you convince us? I think that's very important. So we started with defining um, a conceptual framework for wave nexus, particularly for the SADC region. So we came up with two um, levels of understanding of the wave nexus approach. The first one is we call it the internal um, circle, the green background, which is like the natural system integration, where you can see in the ecosystem, water, energy, and land resources that are very much inter, interlinked um, in, the, in, in nature. So that's recognizing that interconnection at, at natural system level. Then the outer ring, which is water security, energy security. Security is about the human system integration, where we do a number of decisions to achieve water security, for security, and energy security, which is very much around our decision-making governance system. So there are two levels of understanding. Um, by SADC. So that was very important, actually, the first step in the process of institutionalizing the Nexus approach. Next slide, please. 
Then the second thing we did was um, we tried to convince um, what are the challenges we are facing in the Sadek region in terms of food security, energy security, and water security. So as I said, I will give you the, um, a lot of background, but there are some challenges already uh, on these three sectors. And we try to convince if we approach the Nexus approach, actually, then it will help us to simultaneously address water, energy, and food security in the region. So trying to link um, the Nexus approach um, to, to the regional challenges. And you can clearly see how the Nexus approach can actually um, Okay, I don't know. Um, Irene, can you follow me? Am I okay? Yes, perfect. We can. Okay, um, I'm getting a number of messages. Okay. Sorry, yes. Okay, very good. So, um, so that's a connection of the Nexus approach to the regional challenges of water, energy, and food security. We try to establish that one. Then the third level um, is because SADEX is a regional um, economic integration body. So they are also interested in terms of its relevance to promote regional cooperation, regional development, regional integration. So we try to show, for example, if you refer to the, the distribution of resources in the SADC region and the six, 60 member states of the region, um, the, the top part, it, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, if you can go to the next slide, please. Apologies for that. Okay, so if you see this one, the top part uh, it shows the resource endowment in the region, which is uneven distribution of potential land resource and also water resources. So the nexus approach within the regional development approach and understanding, it can actually facilitate regional development through bringing the land resource potential of one country to the huge water resource potential of another country. So if you consider nexus approach, you can actually meet regional level development agendas altogether. The same thing with uh, energy sources. So, so what, what I'm trying to say is like, you have to work around convincing your institution, mandate the government institution, why they should embrace the Nexus approach. So for SADC region, Nexus is also important, um, potentially to contribute to regional cooperation, regional development integration. Next slide, please. Then um, this one is also trying to call, to show them um, its relevance for policy level analysis. Um, so we try to carry out um, what we call it a policy coherence analysis for WF Nexus. Uh, so we try to review regional uh, policies, regional strategies, and uh, programs um, on, on water, on energy, and agriculture. So we try to see how they are coherent in terms of addressing water energy food security. Uh, so we found generally in the in the in the region, the SADC region, most of um, policies and strategies programs in the SADC region related to water are more web nexus coherent compared to energy particularly. So I think that it also gives you important kind of analytical work at policy level so that you can make decision in terms of um, harmonizing and making policies coherent. So that's another area trying to convince the the SADC region. Next slide, please. <coughs> Um, another thing we did was actually trying to up, uh, get appreciation by member states. What does it mean for member states? So we did some, some work trying to identify opportunities of nexus at the respective member states, um, all of the SADC members actually. We tried to identify, okay, these are the challenges we have, these are some of the opportunities that you can address through following the nexus approach. So we did, um, and then finally we developed what we call it nexus perspective papers. So that's actually important in terms of um, creating awareness, understanding, and appreciation for the Nexus approach at the country level. The next one. Then the next one is, you can continue also. Next slide, please. Yeah, next again. Okay, so this one, um, th this one is basically as part of um, um, next appreciation for facilitating investment because SADEC was also interested in addition to um, coordination, policy level, institutional level, they were interested also Nexus to facilitate investment in the SADEC region. So we developed what we call it um, a project screening uh, tool. I, I don't go into the details, but basically it's trying to screen um, the different investment projects in the in SADC region and water, energy, food, trying to identify which projects, investment projects do have potential um, nexus opportunity and try to identify the, the trade-offs and the synergy between the different investments. 
So that's also by way of trying to understand um, and get, get appreciation by the SADC secretariat. And then the next one. So after we did all that, what we did was we um, developed in a very long dialogue process, we developed what we call it a SADC regional wave nexus framework. So this is basically in terms of institutionalizing the nexus approach as part of the SADC governance system. So we didn't create a new structure. That's also very important. But we tried to build on the existing SADC governance structure, creating the only thing we created is actually the SADC wave working group in the secretariat for the purpose of coordination. But as I said, that the remaining are existing structures. So the only thing is we created a kind of reporting system. So there is the, um, uh, the enabling environment for Nexus, the existing policy framework. So we have uh, the decision making bodies, that's the, the Water, Energy, Food Technical Committee, which is already existing. The only thing we requested was to have a joint meeting, committee meeting. And then there is the Water, Energy, Food um, Ministers Committee. They also meet and uh, we promote actually a joint ministers um, meeting so that they can also see the different aspects of the Nexus approach. And the final um, decision-making body is the SADC Council, which is a meeting of uh, Council of uh, Ministers of Foreign Affairs. Um, and very important, another important thing is the SADC Regional Wave Nexus Multi-Stakeholder Platform. That's also part of the structure, uh, which is very useful, actually. So after all that process, uh, we, we managed to um, establish this framework, which is actually endorsed by the SADC minister. So it's actually part of the structure of the, the SADC uh, governance structure. Uh, next one, please. So this is only to show you um, the, the dialogue process, um, the, the very different levels of um, dialogue process, both technical and also on the policy dialogue processes. I, I will not go into that, but the key is the, uh, the joint energy and water ministers, agriculture ministers meeting, and SADC Council of Ministers decision, uh, the Council of Ministers decision. And finally, the last one uh, in 2020, actually October, um, the endorsement um, approval of the regional framework by the joint water energy ministers. Uh, that's very important process actually. But in short, it requires a very long and, and several um, dialogue processes, both technical and um, and uh, policy level processes. The next one, please. So what we are learning, probably just to summarize, the first one is, I think, if you want to really institutionalize, um, make the different um, partners to embrace the next approach, the first thing is to get a high level of political support and ownership. And actually, we were very lucky because there was a very high level support for Nexus approach in the SADC, in the SADC region. So that's very useful. The second one, um, a continuous multi-stakeholder, multi-sector dialogue engagement, as I showed you um, in, the previous, um, in the previous slide. Uh, it's a very long technical and policy level engagement and dialogue process. That's actually very important. The third one, our experience is also to build on existing structure rather than creating new ones, because that's very important. Because if you create a new structure for Nexus only, um, it may be difficult to sustain it actually as, as a structure. So what our preference was to build on the existing SADC structure uh, to, to make sure that the structures exist um, um, for, for, for many years to come. The first one, capacity for analysis to support decision. I think that's very important. That's what we learned in phase one of the, the project. Um, that part was actually not very, very strong. The last one is, as I say, defining the scope and objective of the Nexus approach. I think it's very, very, very useful, actually, to make sure that you um, you get your partners understand and appreciate why are they embracing the Nexus approach. Yeah. So maybe, Irene, I will stop here, and probably if there is any clarification question, I will come back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kidane. I saw that there was already a first question posted in the chat. Um, Dr. Khalid, Mohammed Khalid, do you want to um, take the mic and, and pose your question? Um, let, me, let me thank you for this uh, presentation. The, uh, you have identified many policies, uh, coherence to Nexus uh, establishment as an institution. 
although the time limit was there. And what catches my attention was, what do you identify as the nexus opportunities? What do you identify as the nexus opportunities from SADC perspective? Yes, that's an interesting question. I would interest me as well. Um, maybe Akidane, should I, Hamoud, you raised your hand. Do you have a similar question? Should we get, collect questions or do you want to um, reply already? No, that's fine. Was always is fine for me. Sorry? Was always is fine. I, 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 I don't Okay, Hamoud, do you want to? If the plan questions? is to have questions after each presentation or the, if there is a session for uh, Q&A, so just not to confuse your your, your kind of effort in in moderating. So if you, if the, the room is open for questions, I I have uh, uh, first of all I would like to thank uh, Kidani for for this uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, actually my question is uh, when it comes to regional policy um, dialogue on the nexus, uh, I think the the progress is easier to when it comes to developing regional uh, implementation projects on the nexus those are two 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 scales two two different levels of action and uh, uh, two different levels of approach uh, the second element uh, how in sadec experience uh, have you managed to combine regional dialogue that is a soft uh, exercise and the uh, country specific uh, peculiarities on the nexus, because when it comes to implementation, it doesn't happen as a regional phenomena. It, it happens in the local condition. So how do you bring together the two pieces, uh, regional policy dialogue and local uh, uh, specific context of uh, local institutions, local capacities, local investment on the nexus? Because those are two different things. How do you combine them? Very good. Maybe uh, can I respond, Irene, to the yes, two first, yes. probably? Yes, okay. please. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much for um, for those questions. So the first question is around, um, I think, interest around nexus opportunities. Um, so from the SADC region, as I mentioned, um, there are several opportunities uh, for application, as I mentioned it, from starting from um, um, promoting for regional cooperation and development, um, and um, identifying policy gaps, um, and, and and particularly if, if I just mention one, um, some of particularly from the from the country's perspective papers, um, some other countries appreciated nexus opportunity opportunity at a very high level of planning processes. For example, when they do their national development plans, um, for example, some of the countries like Zambia, Namibia, South Africa, um, even Botswana, Mozambique, Seychelles, they mentioned nexus um, considerations at overall national development planning process where you can see opportunities at a very high macro level um, in terms of um, optimizing your investment, for example. So that's one high level area. Another one is linking to climate change response strategy. I think South Africa was very much interested to consider nexus in their NAP national adaptation planning process. So the actual experiences and opportunities are very different. But when it comes to priority sectors, for example, um, some of them, they were focusing, for example, if I think Botswana, Botswana, they say their focus is around agriculture and livestock sector. So they wanted um, Nexus to help them improve the efficiency of the agriculture sector, the livestock sector. And then for Mauritius, um, it was more of energy sector efficiency, as just consider environmental sustainability. So I think it depends on the context where you are. And Hamoud, you also mentioned about the, the application of Nexus will be actually governed by the local context, actually. For example, you have a, a, a situation where environmental degradation is a very key, serious problem in a certain specific locality at, a, at the national level. Then the thinking will be how you bring the Nexus approach to, to contribute to addressing those kind of challenges. Uh, so depending on the context, you can actually design what kind of nexus um, program or approach you can define. Um, most of the countries, they consider um, nexus application when they do designing of multipurpose dam projects, for example. So like about five uh, SADC member states, the states they mentioned 
application of nexus um, potentially when they do multipurpose dams, for example. So they can see different scenarios of combining um, different objectives or same project, for example, so that you can attain uh, water, energy, and food security objectives. Yeah, so I think that's uh, a lot of opportunities at different scale and then at different um, levels of implementation. Um, I think I a bit touched about Hamoud, your first question particularly, because the, the process for um, the policy and governance processes, um, they are more coordination, more dialogue, the soft aspect of the Nexus approach. But when it comes to actual investment, um, so it's, it's more of a technical analysis, um, project-based kind of analysis where you can see different scenarios of your investment actually. So that the, the, the approaches are different, but they're they are actually one is supporting the other because if you do nexus in a certain project, you have to still facilitate dialogue, bringing the three sectors, even though you are speaking about one project actually. So still the principle applies, but the, definitely as you said, the approach could be different. Then um, the nexus at regional and national level. Um, actually that's why the first challenge we had was um, how do you harmonize the priorities, interests of member states with the regional level kind of um, priorities, for example? So when we started with SADC, we started with the regional level kind of analysis. We already focused around the regional policies, regional strategies, and the institutional arrangement, where member states already are represented actually in that part of the process. So parallel process was to check what are the priorities for the countries also. That's why we did also national level, uh, what we call it the Nexus perspective papers we developed. So definitely um, th th there are commonalities, but they, uh, definitely if you have to do really a country level, you have to con consider the local context, the national context. And actually that's what exactly what you are doing now in the phase two of this project. Our focus is actually to do a national dialogue process but our focus is in that process, we have to facilitate investment projects, identification uh, of Nexus projects, including some of the demonstration projects. Sorry for taking long, Irene, back to you. No, thank you very much for taking your time to answer these questions so thoroughly. Um, do we have any more questions, Sukidana, um, regarding the... Robert has a question. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, thanks a lot. Very interesting, Kidama uh, Ryan. Um, uh, you, you, I like one of your key messages, which was don't create new structures or duplicate anything if you have already existing structures that fit well to the purpose of Nexus. Um, but then still you said you established or you were able to establish some dedicated Nexus structures like at um, Nexus working committees and, and, and on different levels. So how do do how have you established them? And my question is, have, are they connected to any other um, ongoing structures or meetings? So for instance, if you have a technical meeting on Nexus, um, how is this then integrated into any other council meeting maybe or, or a strategic meeting of uh, SADC? Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. Irene, can I ask, ask you to go to that slide on the SADC framework? I think it would be easier. Yes, that one. So thank you. So if you see the, the green one, no, no, the other one. No, the framework, the governance framework. Yeah. After that one, please. Yes, on that slide. So the green one, as I said, the SADC way of working group, that is only new structure, but it, it's actually like, it, it's a working group bringing water, energy, and food security units of the SADC Secretariat. So the purpose is, it's a kind of, for one thing, it's a coordinating center. For example, for example, if you have like any implementing entity um, initiating a new project in the SADC region, for example, it can be GWP or IUCN or any partner in the region, if they want to initiate a project, it can be even energy sector or water sector only, then they have to get a kind of um, a kind of clearance to check uh, with Nexus opportunities in that in that in that initiative. So they have to submit and get feedback from the the working group. So that way they will play a kind of coordinating role to make sure the Nexus approach is actually implemented. The same thing with the the member states, where member states also initiate 
for regional level kind of prioritization for investment, they also do um, some kind of uh, checking. And that's why we, we developed the tool, the uh, Nexus um, project screening tool actually, so that SADC Secretariat, so the working group can do that exercise. And then again, the, the working group is actually a secretariat um, for the Joint Water Energy Food Technical Committee, which is represented by the member states, the SADC member states. So it, it's, it's acting as a secretariat for that key technical committee meeting. Um, and that's actually which reports to the ministers and goes up to the Council of Ministers. So actually, it's basically secretariat for any nexus activities in SADC region, particularly, including organizing the uh, stakeholder platform. I'm not sure if I um, responded to your question. Um, perfectly. If, if I might, just one follow up. Um, so within the SADC secretariat, there are experts dedicated then to do this job, or is this um, work then done by GWP? Just just to know how you institutionalize in in terms of human capacity. And it's really interesting to to no. know these structures. Very interesting. No, there is, we are not doing anything actually as uh, as GWP. We only provide uh, when they need some support. We provide support for the working group. Other than that. It's within the SADC Secretariat. It's part of its structure, actually. So there's no any additional, okay, when they ask us for like small training or review of some documents, we provide that support. If they need some support in the application of the tool, we can provide the support, kind of. But as as that, this is, this is internal SADC structure. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Kidani. Thank you for your questions. Hamu, did you just raise your hand um, anew, or is this from the from before? Because um, maybe I will just ask you to hold on to your question, um, so that we can move on with the second part, where we will still have ample time to all come in with um, questions and and discussion points. So if you can just hold on to that question or your comment um, and save it for the further round, um, I'll pass on the floor to Tina. Yes, thanks. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce our two guests for today's uh, discussion and exchange on the topic of WEF Nexus institutionalization. And in favor of time, I will keep the introduction short. So please bear with me if I miss um, some aspects of your career. <laughs> So I would like to welcome Mr. Deepak Yavali. He is the former Minister of Water Resources of Nepal. He's an acad uh, academician at Nepal Academy of Science and Technology. And he also chairs the private research firm Interdisciplinary Analysts, uh, specializing in quantitative and qualitative social surveys. Um, Mr. Chiavali is a hydrolo, um, hydroelectric power engineer and a political economist who, during his time as Nepal's Minister of Water Resources in 2002 and 2003, initiated reforms in the electricity and irrigation sectors, focusing on decentralization and promotion of rural participation and governance. And his research focuses on the interface between technology and society as related to water and energy issues from the perspectives of cultural theory. He has served on several government and international commissions and related to water and energy resource development. He has published extensively, uh, both in academic uh, and the popular press, on water and energy resources, environment and development issues. Um, welcome, Mr. Giavali. We are very happy to have you with us today. Thank you. As our second guest, I'd like to introduce Mr. Seppo Rekolainen. He is the former director at the Finnish Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry and chairs the UNECE task force on the water, food, energy, ecosystems nexus. His areas of expertise are water resource management, water pollution control, monitoring of water resources and quality and water uh, security. He has been working as a scientist at the Finnish Environment Institute from the beginning of the 1980s. And subjects of his research have been linked to integrated water management issues. From 2010, he has been the director of the Fresh Water Center at the Finnish Environment Institute. Mr. Rekulainen has a doctoral degree in limnology from the University of Helsinki. 
Um, a warm welcome to you too, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> So I will um, take over from here very quickly. We have only 15 minutes left and we're all looking forward to this discussion. Um, so we heard um, a very thorough uh, presentation on how to institutionalize, how to set up the framework for WebNexus at a regional level. Both of you have experience at this level as well, as well as the national level in your respective countries. I'm going to start with a very broad question just to let you bring in your experiences. Um, um, please fill in the rest of the sentence. The WEF nexus is institu institutionalized when, and I'll, I'll maybe pass uh, uh, the questions for both of you, but I'll let um, Deepak go first. Uh, okay, uh, uh, I would have said uh, three things, uh, and we can expand on it if there's interest in, uh, further down the road. First is how much of silo deafness has been reduced. The silos are deaf to other silos. Okay, that's the first one. A second is, you know, uh, do silos internalize uh, pluralism, both in terms of uh, different subjects, uh, as also between uh, um, uh, sectors and all that. Huh? So, is it only an institution dominated by, let's say, civil engineers interested in construction? Uh, or is it? Uh, or does it also have within the silo enough, say, lawyers, sociologists, economists, uh, hydrogeologists, what have you? Okay. And the third final point is that uh, uh, do these silos engage in problem feeding? Not so much solution feeding because solution feeding is a battleground. Okay. But problem feeding, you know, even trying to understand what the problem is because nexus is useful only when we have wicked problems, not tame problems. Tame problems can be solved by textbook methods of economics or engineering or whatever. But if you have uh, b b you know, wicked problems, well, climate change, uh, energy, water security, you know, all these things are very wicked, intermeshed with God knows what else. Okay? So for those, that's where Nexus is very important. I'll stop for now. Thank you for giving us a context of when the nexus comes in. Seppo, how do you want to finish the sentence? Uh, thank you very much. And first, thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting webinar. It's very, very important also for me to hear, hear about the, your work in, around the world. Uh, nevertheless, uh, what comes to the uh, nexus, I very much agree with, with, with Nipak, uh, what, what he just said that uh, the silos, when the, uh, it's very important that the silos start to understand that the other silos are also important for themselves. And uh, since I think uh, this is a very general phenomenon in, in all the countries that the ministries, the line ministries are very much in the silos. So sometimes we need some uh, some uh, structures, uh, preferably existing structures above the uh, line ministries. Uh, so that they can push the line ministries to start to understand the uh, interlinkages between between different different sectors. Uh, secondly, I would like to point out that it's not only the governmental structures and the institutions which are important in the Nexus work. It's uh, even as important is that the businesses and also the civil societies, non-governmental organize, organizations, understand and work in a way that they take into account uh, not only those SDGs which they are mostly interested in, or, but also those which, which are very much, very highly linked linked to, to, for example, to water. So I think uh, these are the good starting points when, when we go for, for promoting Nexus understanding. Thank you. Thank you a lot um, for your answers. Um, and next questions we would have would be, is Nexus a power game? And if so, uh, how can we make sure that there is more than one winner? Okay, I would have rather said uh, that Nexus is a limits to power game. You know, it is actually getting others, every silo, to realize that there are limits to their power. You know, if I'm a water engineer in a, a dam constructing department, you know, I should realize that there are severe limits to my desire for dams because there are other things in. 
and uh, I must actually uh, uh, congratulate and thank uh, Dr. Kidane for his presentation because he had made four points uh, that uh, are extremely valid uh, in understanding these power games. First and most important that he said was this is a it requires high level political support. You know, without that, uh, forget it. Yeah? I mean, the things will just collapse. Particular sectors, you know, if they have better year of the prime minister or the president or whoever, uh, will always get their way through and then end up in a mess afterwards. That's a different story. Uh, he also mentioned this thing about uh, building on existing structure, okay, which is important. Don't try to create a new structure. Uh, the new structure will never be institutionalized probably in our lifetimes. Uh, but institutionalize the process within which the existing structures interact. And finally, the most important was uh, research to unearth what I would have called uncomfortable knowledge. This is something that I had long discussions with my late friend, uh, Water Resource Minister of South Africa, Professor Kader Rasmal. And I congratulated him saying that South Africa, uh, you know, you have in the global south probably the best water laws. And you also have... Uh, uh, the most pluralized of institutions in South Africa. And Professor Kidane's uh, presentation just proves the point. So this is more about limits to power uh, rather than, uh, you know, uh, uh, expanding on one's power. So yeah, you, okay. we, yeah, you mentioned it in, in a similar point to me when we discussed that the prime minister plays an important role in all of this, um, which picks up on one of the points that Deepak mentioned, high level support. Do you want to elaborate on this? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, it's not a power game. Well, limits to power or however you would like to express it. I mean, there is no winner. Everyone has to be a winner. I mean, food sector cannot be a winner without water sector and water sector cannot be a winner without uh, energy sector and energy sector cannot be a winner without water. That's clear. So it's uh, so it's a win-win situation. So when when everybody starts to understanding that we need need all the sectors to support our own sector, so to say, so I don't see any any kind of a power game here. But of course, uh, Traditionally, for example, in many countries, for example, the energy sector and agricultural sector is more powerful compared to the environmental sector or water sector. So we have a history in our background and that's something what we have to win before we can move, move forward. Thank you. And I will pick up on the questions that were posted in the chat. Um, Your Excellency, Mr. Gyawali, coming up with the issues of pluralism in the application of institutionalization of nexus. How do you harmonize these in the same context of water, energy and food security? Could you please share more light on silo implementation of pluralism of nexus? Uh, OK, that's uh, that, that's the million dollar question. OK, uh, it requires uh, at the highest political level. Uh, uh, you know, a, a prime minister or in the interregional uh, cases where you have these commissions, you know, uh, the Niger Basin Commission or the uh, Mekong Commission or whatever, it requires this highest political level to really reflect and set the goals. Okay. Uh, uh, and in doing that, uh, what they have to really figure out is the institutions that are under them will play games. Listen, every every department plays games. Bureaucratic games are played all over the world. OK, uh, increasing their uh, empire, so to speak. OK, but here is the highest level that really has to figure out uh, in the feedback they're getting from different departments. Is it uh, really narrow? Uh, are civil engineers only pushing construction projects or have they even considered, for instance, what the farmers think about food production, uh, what, uh, let's say, the energy uh, people have uh, realized that you can't keep importing for fossil fuel because your country is going bankrupt uh, with the uh, energy price and so on. So this requires, I think, uh, the, uh, the highest political level to make sure that these silos have these other voices, uh, 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 other disciplines and other voices built in. And uh, that sometimes uh, is so politically entrenched in these silos. It's uh, I have faced it. It's quite an uphill battle. Thank you very much. Um, so I think it would be very interesting to learn more about your concrete experiences. Um, so do you have any 
yeah, from your experience, what were really like key positive aspects leading to a positive intersectoral um, coordination? I can give an example in Nepal of uh, good and bad in the same institution. Uh, we in the 1970s, late 1970s, uh, built what we call the Water and Energy Commission. Okay, and this had uh, 12 the the permanent secretaries of 12 different ministries related to water and energy. Uh, you know, just not the water ministry, but you know, finance, foreign affairs. Uh, um, uh, you know, oil importing guys, uh, forest ministry, watershed people, all of them were represented there. And in its uh, best days, uh, they were talking to each other. They were discussing each other's projects and modifying them uh, in light of the concerns of the others. OK, in the worst of cases, when especially political systems started becoming highly competitive and we had coalition governments that were fragile, and uh, ministries were, uh, you know, partitioned between different parties. Uh, then, the, then the silo effect really took over, and an institution like the Water and Energy Commission really became uh, nearly defunct at times. You see, because the issues were never discussed there. Each ministry and each minister just wanted to hold on to whatever power they had and uh, not share it with the other coalition partners. You know. So this, there are examples of good and bad that one can think of. There are many examples like that. Thank you. I was just informed that there's a question in the French channel, so we will give um, the interpreter some time to move between the channels um, so that he can translate for us here at the English channel. Laurent, just give me a heads up when you're when you've made the switch. I believe the question is from Mam. Mane Abdu. I don't know. I should. And Laurent is here. I see him. Perfect. Um, the floor is yours, Laurent, to translate Mamane's question. Um, so, oh, um, I'm sorry, I can't hear the question really. Okay, maybe you can you can write it down and then we can uh, post it here on the chat and then I can um, translate it. But it's okay. We uh, yes from Niger. Hello. So a question from Niger. So through the different experiences. The uh, Niger Basin Authority. Created in 1964. Uh, well, went through a number of adaptation in the 80s. It is in charge of the uh, integrated development of the basin. through the knowledge of uh, natural resources, especially on the surface. And we are promoting the cooperation between nine states to ensure an integrated development of the Niger Basin in, in all countries, in all neighboring countries. Mm. 
uh, I think it's especially concerning water resources, energy, agriculture, uh, fish factories, forest, uh, forest, forest activities. transport and communication. This is why it is present in all nine states through, through different uh, focal points representing them. Through a focal point in every member state, I I can hear the I can hear the gentleman, but he can't hear me. Uh. So it is represented at the, every state level through a national uh, focal point. Maybe we can ask him to write his question in the chat. Uh, well, uh, all stakeholders in natural resources. Um, water resources, energy, agriculture, and members of the commission, uh, as such as I just said. So we are in this nexus complex. Monsieur, monsieur, uh, excusez-nous, est-ce que, est que vous pourriez poser la question euh, par écrit dans, dans le chat parce que je crois qu'il y, y a un petit problème de, de temps. Ça vous ennuie? So I thank you very much for your experience and uh, thank you very much and uh, I look forward to hearing from your experiences again. Yes, uh, so I think we continue on the English chat. I hope, uh, Mr. Abdu, you will um, post your question in writing so that we can still pass it on um, and and address it in the discussion. We will move on um, with the interview in the English channel. Um, Mariana has uh, posted a question. Um, she, she mentions that Seppo uh, mentioned that the most powerful sector um, how do you how do you you mention the different um, power levels of the different sectors? How do you get the most powerful sector to join in on the nexus process? Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, well, my example was about the energy sector and agricultural sector, and I think there has been a very good progress uh, in recent years of those sectors that they understand uh, better and better that uh, without water for example they cannot they cannot uh, survive or survive or, or, or do their business but uh, even more powerful might be the finance sector uh, the ministry of finance and that's uh, an example of what we have started here in Finland, uh, that uh, the state budget is more and more based on, on uh, sustainable development goals. That certainly doesn't guarantee that the nexus is taken into account in a proper way, but at least that there's a, there's a good start and a good way also to get uh, the second more powerful sectors like agriculture and energy more and more involved with the uh, with the nexus processes so that's i think uh, one example thank you do we have the french question um written or or should we move on to the um an, a question that's in the english chat um written by antonio antonio do you want to ask it directly hi Irene, how you doing um I think it's a similar question to the one you mentioned from uh, from Mariana. First of all, thanks to the speakers. Very interesting. Um, I very much liked this um, the, the concept that you mentioned about silo deafness between the sectors. 
Um, and it seems that the, the, the silo definitely is going to be very related to the inherent power asymmetries between the sectors. Um, as we mentioned, the energy sector usually is a lot more powerful than the water sector, and so is the agricultural sector. So uh, I was wondering from your experience, if there are uh, replicable experiences from other countries where such power gains between the sectors have been have evolved or have been transformed into collaborative efforts, and if so, um, how? I mean, this this could be a, an extremely you know loaded question, but just a, a few words of, you know, look at this country, look at the sector where, where, where this has been done very uh, successfully. Thank you. Can I respond to this? Yeah, um, it's a very, you know, you, you asked a very good question. Um, the, there's so many examples and I really wish we were having this meeting face to face, you know, with no COVID. Uh, because this is something that you can sit over a lunch and dinner and argue for hours. But I'll give you one example, you know, that's really worth uh, examining because it has been studied very well. OK, uh, um, uh, many years ago, uh, Unilever, la the multi you know, national company that manufactures, I don't know, soap and all kinds of things. Huh? They ran into a problem because the German Greens protested uh, about some product they were using saying there's some kind of harmful chemical of course as usual the company denied it and in first but then when the evidence was too much you know they were uh, they uh, were um, uh, pushing back but wiser voices prevailed within the com uh, the company and they said well let's not because german greens are pretty nasty and what they do is if they boycott our products we had it okay so let's step back okay in stepping back, they suddenly realized internally within their, uh, where their company that they already had a product that did not, uh, they had done the research, they had found and in their research shelf, they had a product that didn't have that particular chemical. But it was never brought into manufacturing because nobody had raised that issue, okay? So suddenly, because the German Greens were able to raise that voice and because the Unilever as a company uh, realized that you should listen to other voices, you know, that they found out that they already had a solution which they were blind to. Okay, so this is just an example of, uh, you know, silo blindness, which needs to be sort of broken sometimes by voices from the outside. You know, and so the question of pluralism and you know democratic policy, plural terrain as we call it, uh, is extremely important. I mean, I could go on with other examples, but one more might be the story of Brent Spar the oil rig that in the North Sea that was supposed to be just dumped into the ocean. Uh, but uh, Shell and uh, the British Petroleum, uh, the, uh, UK, uh, the uh, Norwegian and the other companies chickened out because the Greens put up a fight. Margaret Thatcher called the companies wimps. Said, she said they should have just dumped it into the sea. But the better voices pre prevailed. And then they suddenly found out that they didn't need to dump that oil rig into the, into the North Sea that it could be cut up and uh, it was made into very nice, uh, you know, jetties and, uh, you know, transport things in the Norwegian fjords. Okay, So it is actually these penetrating other outside voices that silos, are they open to? This is one of the things about the <coughs> silo. Are they even open to such voices? You see? So this is uh, what I would say. Thank you. Um, so I ask, I, I hope it's okay if we um, overstep the time by approximately um, 15 minutes, allowing Mariana a couple of minutes at the end for closing words. I suggest we take the last two questions that were posted in the English chat um, by Rustam. Um, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Otherwise... Uh, hi, yeah. yeah, I'm actually I, on a crowded uh, playground, so it's going to be too loud. <laughs> I'll read it out loud then. Um, I think the most important idea was voiced when the economic and political situation is stable. It brings all to the table and everyone is willing to work jointly. However, when money is scarce and there are challenges in feeding all wants and wills, then we face issues. The challenge is how to ensure cooperation during difficult times. Um, I'll, I'll let you. Uh, that's that's where political statesmanship is so important. Okay. Uh, it makes all the difference, but uh, when times are difficult, and I can tell you the most difficult time when Nexus really comes to the fore is during disasters. You know, at disaster time, you know, things will have broken down. Standard ways of doing business will have really broken down. 
and that's really it's not a nice word to use but that's disasters are really a forensic opportunity moment and if people advocating the nexus approach have their plans and alternative stuff ready that's a time when things can really be sprung up you know and uh, the, the 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 nexus approach integrated even better uh, in normal times if that opportunity is taken advantage of If Thank I you. may, yeah. may add, add a little bit, I yeah, very much agree with Deepak, but uh, just to add something for that, uh, Central Asia, by the way, is a nice, nice example where political will is really, really important to get forward in in implementing the SDGs and, and taking the Nexus uh, links, which are very, very strong in that region, taking them into account. But what is needed uh, for political will is the trust. There must be trust between the neighboring countries in the region. If there's no trust, there's no political will, and you cannot buy political will in the in the shop around the corner. So it has to be a political trust between the neighboring countries. So that brings that uh, that's the uh, first thing to to take into account before uh, more than more can happen. So thanks. Yes, that seems to be the key point. I actually would love to continue talking and find out how you. Um build up that trust and keep everybody uh, around the table. But I'll, I'll finish up with the question Neha has posted in the French chat. He says the Niger Basin Authority has put in place national focal points called the NFS that were created in the spirit of Nexus. But so far, we're not really operational as, the, um, as visioned by, envisioned by the MBA. What do you recommend for the operationalization of these national focal points representing the Niger Basin? authority in the Can national I, governments. Yeah, I would like to respond to that. And this is something, uh, Irin, that we discussed uh, when we had that uh, you know, discussion. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> sorry. I, I would suggest that uh, the Niger Basin Authority really look at the Rhine cleanup after the Sandoz spill of 1986 and how it was really, uh, uh, you know, the Rhine was really cleaned up. I and mean, it's an example. But so it is probably the best example in the world. And my argument has been if Rhine, which was the industrial sewer of Europe, could be cleaned up, you know, any river in the world can be cleaned up. Uh, so there is a good example. But the basic message of the Rhine cleanup uh, from the perspective of cultural theory, which is what I do, this new social, newfangled social science, is that the uh, highest authority, the political authorities at the highest level of the Niger Basin Authority, must set up goals and do the monitoring, but should avoid the temptation of implementing. The implementing should be left to the lowest unit of governments, not even the country level. It should be implemented at, you know, in the Swiss and German examples, the cantons and the landers or whatever they call them, the lowest governance units, okay? They should do the implementation and they should do that implementation by bringing in all the voices. The voices of uh, local government is obviously there, but the voices of uh, uh, businesses, industries in their in their particular uh, cantons and landers, as well as the academics and the churches and the you know the egalitarian voices, the civic voices. Okay, if that happens, uh, you have a far better chance of success. Otherwise, if it is just left to the highest level commission to also implement then uh, I'm afraid uh, not, nothing much will move forward. You pick out on something that Hepo has also mentioned, so bringing in the support of of different governance um, structures and levels. Seppo, do you want to respond? As well? Yes, agree that very much. But uh, it's also important in in the, in the for example, in the Niger, Niger River, case because there are several countries was it nine countries or something like yeah. that who are partners partners that uh, uh, because we have to find an optimized water use and also water pollution but water use between different uses water uses energy agriculture and so on but also between all the countries which is an extra challenge when we are talking in transboundary 
conditions and that is a challenge. We need the local governments uh, uh, to implement uh, the measures, but there has to be some coordination that, uh, for example, the equitable uh, water allocation between the countries and different uses between the countries uh, is taken taken into account reasonable way. So that's a, that's a extra challenge in transboundary conditions. Thank you. So you just um, added the very important point of also having regulations and, and legally binding eventually um, on top of the soft um, contributions. And I guess um, just finishing on what Deepak also said, um, let's uh, maybe organize a virtual tour to visit the Rhine Commission and hear from them on how they operationalize such structures. And hopefully that would help our colleagues at the MBA. And with this, I have to close the interview round. And we, I'm sorry if you already took too much of your time. And I'm now going to hand over to Mariana for the head of the Nexus um, component at the GZ to hold the closing words. Thank you. Thank you, Rene. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sepo, and, and thank you, Deepak, for your valuable contributions. Also, Kidane, uh, because uh, when uh, uh, contributions com come from practice, I think it's easier to, to connect and to have a concrete idea what to look at when institutionalizing the Nexus. I'm, but I'm, I think like in very important takeaways is, um, as Kidane mentioned, taking advantage of existing structures, aligning regional priorities with national priorities, and uh, thereby getting uh, high-level political support. Uh, because at the end, um, if you want to move forward with the so-called, if we want to call it a power, power game, you still need uh, high political support and especially win the most powerful sectors. Uh, CEPO gave us the importance of winning the energy and agricultural sector and uh, gave us examples how also the climate agenda can bring, uh, let's say, the sectors closer together. Uh, very important also how crisis can be an opportunity to foster cooperation. We looked at the Rhine River cleanup uh, which is a very nice uh, example of uh, transboundary cooperation, a cooperation between nine uh, countries, which uh, managed to clean uh, the one of well, the biggest one of the biggest rivers in in Europe. Um, by then, establishing an institutional structure to keep on this collaboration, this joint collaboration. Uh, and at the end, uh, by having high political support and building trust. I think you can move on on having legally binding agreements that can institutionalize this uh, collaboration. So I think this has been a, a very nice um, webinar on the Nexus institutionalization. I think there is a lot of room still for discussion and I felt in the group the energy to keep on discussing this. I, I think we should have a follow-up uh, session for getting deeper into the questions that we have starting discussing on because I mean we are looking at let's say key elements but probably we have to elaborate more deeper in how to get to these key elements this building uh, political trust getting the high level political support how to to get there is uh, the, um, probably the biggest challenge um, for institutionalizing such a, a cross-sectoral uh, collaboration, which the Nexus aims for. So, well, again, thank you, uh, Deepak, thank you, Sepo, thank you, uh, Kidane, thank you to the representative of the five different regions from Central Asia, from Latin America, from uh, the Middle East and Northern Africa, from West Africa, from Niger Basin Authority, from the Lake Chat Basin Commission, um, and also at the beginning, uh, our colleagues from the European Union. Uh, this has been a short, but I think fruitful session, and uh, we'll be, keep in touch to, I think, do a follow up and getting deeper on this uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you to the Thank participants you. in the French channel as well. Sorry for the difficulties, the technical difficulties. Yes. Thank you. Bye.